become popular for both men and women to joyfully proclaim that the future is female. There is a lot wrong with this statement. The presumption that women will feature more prominently than men in the future is highly suspect. So is the notion that this would be a good thing for women. Also implicit in the claim that the future is female is the notion that the past was male. This is a very widely held view. It is also entirely untrue. This notion is part of the feminist historical narrative in which feminists have constantly repeated claims about history that simply don't, mention, don't match the facts. Unfortunately, the feminist historical narrative is so prevalent that even many non-feminists buy into it. Today, I will discuss various aspects of history, including the historical roles of men and women at selected times and places, in order to show that both men and women have been partners in society throughout history and all around the world. Many people today, men and women alike, are angry at what they believe were historical injustices done against women. These so-called injustices are largely invented or massively overstated. Women were leaders, traders, farmers and merchants. They worked alongside men and the children. Men did not oppress women historically, far from it. Men have shown a preponderance to willingly give up their lives for women, even women that they do not know. This is at the core of the ideas of male disposability and gynocentrism. Both men and women suffered throughout history. While history is characterised by feminist ideology as a struggle by women to free themselves from the oppression of men, the reality is that both men and women struggled. Just as we may have been on the verge of creating a truly egalitarian society, feminism has arisen and recasts history as a struggle against women's oppression. Out of this has arisen ideologies like intersectionality and identity politics. These ide ideologies are causing serious damage to our society. We live in the shadow of the Victorian era. In the strictest sense, the Victorian era was the period of the reign of Queen Victoria from 1837 to 1901. While the period was one of rapid social and technological change, it is today most often associated with prudishness, strict morality and limited rights for women. As industrialization spread, these trends went on to be seen in the US in a phenomenon called American Victorianism. The Victorian fallacy describes the tendency of large portions of Western civilization to equate the, equate the notion of history with the Victorian era. Most people think that history all around the world was like the Victorian era in the Anglosphere. It wasn't. The attributes that the Victorian era are associated with today, while being themselves an oversimplification, are presumed to have been mainstays of human history. This is demonstrably false. Sexual mores, and morality, sexual mores, morality and the rights of women relative to men have varied considerably around the world and throughout history. Even the Victorian era itself was often not as feminists portray it to be. Indeed, the name of the era itself comes from a queen. The truth is that men and women were both active participants in society. Men, women and children worked. Men and women participated in and led religions. Men and women participated in and led governments. This is their story. The feminist historical narrative holds up the idea of the patriarchy. This idea was originally developed by American feminist Kate Millett and is entirely unrelated to the notion of patriarchy used by anthropologists and sociologists. Feminists generally define the patriarchy as a system in which men systematically oppress women, while to anthropologists and sociologists, patriarchy is merely a system in which men lead the family. These two concepts are entirely distinct and should not be confused. Feminism relies heavily on the confusion between these two definitions. The notion of the patriarchy espoused by feminists has gone from being a, a radical fringe view to being mainstream, not only among feminists, but the wider community. Much of the criticism leveled at, feminism, at men by feminists is justified by a belief in the patriarchy. Mainstream feminism posits that men have an intrinsic advantage in society merely for being men. They call this privilege and constantly entreat people to check it. This is a very binary view of the world, presuming that one gender has an intrinsic advantage over the other. It would be more accurate to say that both men and women have problems specific to their gender. Unfortunately, feminists have shown a consistent trend of ignoring the problems facing men and boys, and much of this occurs because of their belief in the patriarchy. 
It is now almost universally accepted in Western countries that all societies prior to the modern age were patriarchies. It is also often believed by both men and women that modern Western countries are still patriarchies. This may seem like a reasonable presumption on the surface. After all, men did run all societies in the past, didn't they? Not so much. In reality, societies have generally constrained both men and women, forcing them into certain roles to serve the society itself. Many societies had a minority of female rulers. Claims of patriarchy must explain why a patriarchal system would ever permit any female rulers. Some feminists attempt to explain the rise of women into leadership roles as a result of inter intersectionality. The principal problem with this argument is that oppressors do not allow any member of an oppressed group into the ruling class, regardless of any other characteristics they have. Indeed, any members of the oppressed group that might be possible leaders are often eliminated by their oppressors. Any suggestion that the antebellum South in the United States would have permitted an African-American interstate government is obviously absurd. And yet feminists ask us to believe that the patriarchy permitted queens, empresses and high priests. High priestesses. Yes, there were free African-Americans in the antebellum South, and some of them even owned plantations and slaves but there was simply a limit to their power and influence. Those arguing for the patriarchy must explain why societies around the world allowed women to rule in their own right. Many examples are given here, and many more examples exist. Each woman, each, each woman below ruled a powerful state. Some ruled in their own right, and some as regents, but they were all autocrats. A few examples of historically powerful women are offered here in chronological order. Merneith was a queen in ancient Egypt. She may have been the first female pharaoh. Her name means beloved of Neith. Neith was an ancient Egyptian goddess who was the first creator. Another female pharaoh, Hatshepsut. Uh, although she was co-regent with her stepson, she was one, the one that held the title of pharaoh. Artemisia I of Caria was, was a queen in ancient Greece. Olympias was the wife of Philip of Macedon and mother of Alexander the Great. After being widowed, she had another widow, a widow of Philip and their infant daughter killed. Later, during a power struggle, she had over 100 opponents put to death. Cleopatra Thea was a descendant of Ptolemy I and, rule, and ruler of an empire. Her epithet what means goddess. She divorced, remarried, and murdered her son so she could take his place leading the empire. An attempt to murder another son to strengthen her rule failed, and he murdered her. Cleopatra VII was another descendant of Ptolemy I and is well known as the consort of Julius Caesar and Mark Antony. She was also pharaoh after having won a power struggle with her older sister and younger brother. Boudicca is another well-known female leader. She was initially in a power struggle in which her tribe, the Iceni, supported her as leader over the Romans. Later she fought the Romans, but was ultimately crushed by Roman military might. Zenobia was a queen in Palmyra and what is now Syria. At the time, Palmyra was subordinate to the Roman Empire. After her husband's death, she became the regent of her minor son, then led the nation to independence, declaring the short-lived Palmyran Empire. Within a few years, Rome had defeated the nascent empire. She was taken to Rome with her son to be paraded along alongside the spoils of war in a Roman triumph. Irene of Athens engaged in a prolonged power struggle with her son Constantine VI for control of the Byzantine Empire, culminating with her arranging to have her son's eyes gouged out. He was then imprisoned or died, but either way he was no longer a threat to his mother's power. Theophano was regent of the Holy Roman Empire during the minority of her son too. She may have also had an affair with a future antipope. The 16th century was a time of powerful female rulers in Western Europe. Queen Elizabeth ruled for what amounts to the second half of the 16th century. She was no figurehead either. She was the absolute ruler of England and Ireland. Legally, she was a queen regnant, which is generally the which is meaning she ruled in her own right and was not a queen consort, who was generally the wife of a king. Elizabeth I is not well known throughout the English-speaking world, and is generally remembered as, excuse me, Elizabeth I is well known around, throughout the English-speaking world, 
and is generally remembered as an effective leader who reformed the English state and built up a strong navy in the face of external military threats. Others show that while the early years of her reign was generally prosperous, this was not so later on. What all these sources agree on was that Elizabeth was queen in her own right. The decisions made by her were, were hers. It should be clear that this was that she, it could be clear from this that she was the leader of the English and Irish states. She was no figurehead. What is generally not as well known is that there were several contemporary female monarchs in the British Isles. Immediately preceding Elizabeth I as Queen of England and Ireland was Queen Mary I, her half-sister. Queen Mary I is also known as Bloody Mary, as she had a habit of ordering the death of her subjects, usually by burning them at the stake, when they didn't agree to her religious views. Mary I didn't reign for long, thankfully given her penchant for violence, but was every bit as much in charge of England and Ireland as Elizabeth would be after her. Each effectively changed the national religion while reigning. It is worth noting that Mary, that Mary I's main competition for, for control of England and Ireland was another woman, Lady Jane Grey. In the end, Mary made sure that Jane's head ended up rolling around in the basket rather than wearing a crown. When Mary I married, the, ter, married, the terms of the marriage contract made her and her foreign husband joint rulers of England. He could not act without her consent. It is clear that the English nobility trusted an English woman more than a foreign man. Nationality trumps gender. When Mary died in 1558, the crown did not remain with her foreign husband and rather went to her English half-sister Elizabeth I. To the north of England was Scotland, which was ruled by a Queen Regnant from 1542 to 1567. She is generally known as Queen Mary of Scots in English, probably to, to, to distinguish her from Mary I, who was her contemporary. Her rule of Scotland overlaps that of both Mary I and, Mary, and Elizabeth I. The entirety of the British Isles was ruled over by female monarchs from 1553 to 1567. This period would likely have gone on much longer, except that Elizabeth imprisoned and eventually executed Mary, Queen of Scots, after she set fled south seeking Elizabeth's protection. Elizabeth apparently viewed Mary, Queen of Scots, as a potential rival, since Mary was her cousin once removed. Mary, Queen of Scots, was fleeing south to England, as she was suspected then and now of being a tacit accomplice in the brutal murder of her second husband. Mary, Queen of Scots, was an, absolute, was an absentee monarch during her early life, having spent her youth in France. Scotland was left in the hands of another woman, her mother, Mary of Guise. So during this period, we had Lady Jane Grey, Mary I, Elizabeth I and Mary Queen of Scots vying for power across the British Isles. While Mary I's husband was in England, yet another woman, Joan of Austria, was regent in Spain. Joan's minor son ascended to the throne of Portugal and it was his grandmother, Catherine of Austria, who became regent there. These women ruled as ruthlessly as any male ruler. They also demonstrated that they were quite prepared to order the torture and execution of their enemies or those they perceived as enemies. These historical events and others that occurred in many other parts of the world throughout history demonstrate that these women were not helpless pawns of the patriarchy. A society matching the feminist definition of patriarchy would not permit female rulers. Women would simply not find their way into positions of power. Even a cursory view of history reveals that female rulers feature across a wide variety of societies and eras. The reality is that societies shape social expectations of men and women to fit their own needs. Suffrage, or the right to vote, is an important right in any democracy. Societies routinely exclude some sectors of the community from voting, and this is entirely consistent with international norms. Normally, voting in a democracy is open to citizens that have reached the age of majority. In many countries today, that is 18 years. The rules vary by country and even subnational jurisdiction. Generally, voting is restricted to citizens, but even they may be excluded from voting if they have resided outside of the country for an extended period, if they have been convicted of or incarcerated for serious offences or for other reasons. Prohibiting individuals from voting in this manner is considered to be consistent with international standards today. This is generally called universal suffrage, even though segments of the community are excluded from voting. What is not considered acceptable by democracies today is to exclude someone from voting on the basis of gender. 
It is widely believed today that women were disenfranchised from voting until recently. This is true, but what is often not stated is, an, is, the, is, this, is this narrative is that the same was true for most of all men. In general, nations that became independent during the 20th or 21st centuries granted universal suffrage to men and women at the same time. In nations that became independent during the 19th century, men typically led women by a few years or decades obtaining suffrage. A survey in 1780 in the UK, for example, revealed that only 3% of the population were entitled to vote. Britain had no less than three acts of parliament during the 19th century that enfranchised a growing proportion of men, and yet a significant proportion of the male population remained unable to vote. Voting rights in the UK, as in most nations, were initially based on land ownership. This often meant that land-owning women could vote, but land, men without land could not. There is, there is documentary evidence that British women who owned land were voting as early as 1843, decades before men, most men obtained the right to vote. Many men were still disenfranchised when conscription was enacted in the UK in 1917, as the number of volunteers prepared to fight in World War I waned. Many of these men drafted and forced to war against the will were unable to vote. The year the war ended, 1918, the UK finally granted full enfranchisement to men. At the same time, many women over 30 were permitted to vote. Had women been fully enfranchised in 1918, along with men, they would have constituted a majority of voters due to significant numbers of men killed during World War I. Women were finally given fully enfranchised in 1928, only 10 years after men received full enfranchisement in the UK. In the UK, we see a pattern repeated around the world. The franchise was held by a small group of people that grew over time. In the United States, many states had laws that restricted the rights of African Americans, male or female. As a result, there was a far wider divide between black and white citizens of the US than there was between men and women in terms of their ability to have a voice in the running of the nation. Even after the civil rights movement, black Americans continued to experience impediments to, in their, to their ability to vote in elections. Originally, most US states only enfranchised landowners, as was common around the world in the 18th and 19th centuries. Gradually, the right to vote was extended to citizens in the US that were considered to be white. Suffrage in the US included all white men by 1870. White women were fully enfranchised in 1920. Men in Australia started to receive the franchise between 1857 and 1896, depending on their colony of residence. This allowed them to vote for colonial parliaments. In general, only white men were permitted to vote, with the notable exception of any New Zealand Maori who happened to be living in Australia. White and Maori women in Australia started voting, were we started receiving the franchise in the 1890s. Today, it is common for gender to be overemphasized as a defining characteristic. Culture, ethnicity, social class at birth, and many other characteristics are better determiners of the life a person will have than is gender. Historically, most men and women were disenfranchised. Power rested with the ruling class, men and women alike. While it was generally true that men were more likely to wield hard power and women soft power, even this was not universally true. There were far more female rulers wielding hard power than is generally known, with a study of European monarchs finding that 18% were queens regnant, queens who ruled in their own right. Feminists so often put the focus on enfranchisement on voting rights for women, as if this was, this was an event that occurred in a vacuum. The enfranchisement of women is in fact only a part of the greater story. Over a period of centuries, the body of electors grew, Impediments to the franchise included ethnicity, gender, property, age, wealth, literacy, and education. This process is in fact ongoing, with increasing moves to enfranchise resident non-citizens and to further reduce the voting age. The enfranchisement of women was just one step among many, and not one that was easily separated from the enfranchisement of men in many nations. Polytheistic religions around the world have, have, world have included pantheons of male and female deities. While it is true that a male deity was often at the head of the pantheon, there were often many powerful female deities. Hera was a powerful goddess in ancient Greece, one of the 12 Olympians, of whom five or six were female, depending on the inclusion of Dionysus or Hestia.
Hera was queen of the gods in ancient Greece, and as such ruled over Mount Olympus. Athena is perhaps the most interesting of the female Olympians, being the goddess of wisdom, courage, civilization, and law. Athena shares the realm of war with the male god Ares, producing a sense of gender balance in this sphere. The ancient Greeks made their deity of wisdom a goddess. This would not seem to me the most appropriate choice for a society that, according to feminists, systematically oppressed women. The Roman equivalent of Hera was Juno. Juno was also queen of the gods in Roman mythology, and was part of a member of the, of the Capitoline Triad, along with Jupiter and Minerva. This means that to the Romans, two of the three most important deities were female. Minerva was the Roman equivalent of Athena, and was thus goddess of wisdom. Like Athena, the Greek goddess Artemis was a virgin. Various stories in Greek mythology have people attempting to dishonour or even rape Artemis. Anyone who tried died violently. These stories about Artemis demonstrate that ancient Greek culture viewed the rape of women as a serious crime worthy of severe punishment. Again, we see gender balance in the primordial gods of the Greek pantheon, with Gaia the Earth Mother, mother being the mother of the Titans. The Egyptian triad of Memphis, the three most powerful deities in Egypt, were two goddesses and a god, including Isis. Late in Egyptian antiquity, Isis was regarded as having the most powerful magical powers of all Egyptian deities, and became widely worshipped in Nubia as well as Egypt. Later, her worship spread throughout Europe. Worship of Isis declined as Christianity arose and only ended in 500 AD. Going further back, both priests and priestesses were very powerful in the early Sumerian culture, with the earliest known poet, whose name is known, being a Sumerian prince, a priestess. Some feminists argue that Isis was a reflection of a patriarchal culture with acting in a supporting role to her son Osiris, to her husband Osiris, and son Horus. They point out that she spent her time picking up after her husband. This, she wasn't really picking up after him, so much as picking him up. He'd been killed, dismembered, and in one of her key stories, Isis went all around Egypt fighting bits of her husband and giving them proper funerary rites. Ephesus was a city in ancient Asia Minor and was the home of one of the ancient wonders of the world, the Temple of Artemis. Artemis was a goddess in the ancient Greek pantheon, daughter of Zeus, and twin sister of Apollo. She was one of the most widely worshipped deities in the pantheon and covered many spheres, including hunting, the wilderness, wild animals, the moon, and chastity. The Romans called her Diana. The temple to Artemis at Ephesus was reputedly four times the size of the pantheon at Parthenon in Athens and made of pure marble. While the Norse had Thor as a god of thunder, nearby Baltic people had a goddess of thunder. The Baltic goddess of the sun was Sole. Other cultures with a sun goddess included some West African pantheons, Basque mythology, Celtic mythology, and some Australian and Aboriginal mythologies. Within the Abrahamic religions, we see many references to prominent women. The Christian Bible also has various references that demonstrate the true nature of ancient societies. In Corinthians 7.33, Paul notes, The unmarried man worries about the things of the Lord, and how to please the Lord, but the married man worries about the things of the world and how to please his wife, for he is torn in two. Here Paul is suggesting that in ancient Judean society, a man will focus on the well-being of his wife, and by extension his family. Hardly an oppressive patriarchy. In Christianity, both men and women have a right to sex in marriage. In Middle Ages Europe, this was known as the marital debt, and unlike today, a husband or wife had to have sex when the other desired. Feminists will claim that men had control of women's bodies, but the historical record makes it very clear that this worked both ways. Matthias of Boulogne married a widow, Petra, who apparently had a very high libido. Poor Matthias complained of having to have sex with his wife 15 times a day. Leaders in the Christian church in the Middle Ages struggled with, to reconcile the need to procreate with the presumed need to deny sexual pleasure to Christian men. They had no problem with Christian women experiencing physical pleasure. One Christian church father noted, returning, to debt, returning the debt to one's wife is nothing more than making your body available to her. Hence, 
One often renders the debt to his wife in such a way that he does not satisfy his pleasure, and conversely. Therefore, in the aforementioned case, I can so render the debt to my wife and wait in such a way until she, she satisfies her pleasure. I can, if I wish, withdraw not satisfying my pleasure, free of all sin and not omitting my seed of propagation. It's clear that the author is talking specifically about giving his wife sexual pleasure or forgiving his own and avoiding ejaculation. We see too that Christian women were not, not beyond using violence to maintain Christian morals. When a young nun from the proprietor of Watton became pregnant to a layman in the community, the nuns captured the man and forced the pregnant nun to castrate him. The nuns then forced his bloody testicles into her mouth, not quite the image of a nunnery we're used to. One of the most misunderstood aspects of history is the involvement of women in the labour force. It's often reported today that women's participation in the labour force is growing. This is only true in a very narrow sense, since women left the labour force in large numbers in the 19th and 20th centuries and are now returning to the labour force. Society was not wealthy enough to have a lot of people not working until recently. Feminism maintains that it, is recent, that it recently freed women from the impress, oppressive confines of the home. This is a cornerstone of many feminist arguments. In hunter-gatherer cultures, women were active in obtaining food for the community, participating in hunting and gathering alongside men and children in many cases. Following the development of agriculture, women were often in the fields alongside the men and children. Few families were wealthy enough that they could afford to maintain people who did not contribute at least part of their time to agriculture. Women often worked outside of agriculture too. We see this all around the world. In ancient Egypt, for example, women could own and run businesses. Wealthy women often ran the affairs of a house, which would include managing a large staff and overseeing the education of the children in the home. This was, in effect, in effect a managerial position. Women were free to move around in medieval Europe, with women moving into city, cities more often than men, resulting in a skewed gender ratio in the countryside. Women in Renaissance Europe earned trade qualifications. It was not unusual for a man and woman to meet in the guild during their apprenticeship, marry and start a small business together. The man would work full time and the woman would split her time between working in the business and caring for children. This sounds decidedly modern to us, but it was the norm through much of history. Takeout food was common in medieval and Renaissance Europe. The food services industry was dominated by women then as now. When industrialization occurred, women could often be found in factories alongside men and children. The idea of the stay-at-home mother is quite recent and one that came about largely as a result of increasing material wealth. It was in fact a conspicuous demonstration of wealth to be able to show that some members of your family need only keep house and raise children. As wealth grew, this phenomenon spread from the wealthy classes to the middle classes it never quite spread to the lower classes, where women continued to engage in paid employment. But then feminists engaged in historical revision in revisionism and convinced the bulk of the population that women had been oppressively confined to the home throughout history. Terribly oppressive, that, not having to work. It's generally recognised today that during the 19th century, children in the industrialised nations worked in factories. The stories of small children being employed as chimney sweeps and a few dying after getting stuck in the chimney, abound. Similarly, we hear of children working in dangerous factory environments, having to run under a machine periodically to sweep up offcuts that had fallen on the floor, only to narrow, narrowly avoid being injured. Parents during this period didn't send their children to work because they, wanted to, they, want, they didn't care about them. They sent them to work because they had to. Today, public discussions often revolve around the need for two income families. Today, the public discussions often revolve around the need for two incomes to keep a family afloat, but, not, but in the 19th century, that wasn't enough. They needed three, four or more incomes just to eat and have a place to, to live. Everywhere we look, we see similar patterns. In the Christian Bible, we find many examples of women working. One of the best examples is of Lydia of Theotira. At least that's how we historians remember her, as her real name is lost. She is thought to have been a Greek from the, from the city of Lydia in Asia Minor. 
As such, Lydia is an ethicon, a name derived from a place. Lydia was the first recorded European adherent to Christianity, and she worked for a living. Lydia might have been a dye merchant, or she might have been an agent for a dye merchant. The details are lost to history. The New Testament, though, records her as selling purple dye in the city of Theotira. Many experts believe she was of Greek Macedonian descent. Purple dye was an expensive item at the time, and what limited evidence we have suggests that Lydia was wealthy. Lydia may have run a business, but she may have run a business, but she definitely had her own home. Her origins are unclear, and while it had been it has been suggested that she was a former slave, this is now thought to be unlikely. She was either a single woman or possibly a widow. It is clear from the biblical account that she controlled her own house as this is mentioned in Acts 16, 11 to 15, and again in Acts 16, 40. In Proverbs 31, we see references to certain activities that women were permitted to engage in ancient Judean society, including purchasing land, farming, and trading. Across government, religion, work, and almost all areas of life, feminists have spun a story, a story of women being oppressed, of not being permitted to work or own property, or of women being property. This is the feminist historical narrative, and we must tear it down and expose it for the lie that it is. This isn't some musty old idea fit for only for, for historians to argue over. It continues to be a platform in which, in, which to, in which to harm men, women, and children today. Feminists justify much of their misandry due to the supposed past injustices against women. Even if this were true, it would amount to collective punishment. But it isn't true. Feminists must paint men as oppressive. If men did not oppress women, then feminism could not have freed them from this oppression. The truth is that men and women were partners historically. Men often took on the dirtier and more dangerous jobs, but women were out there working and sacrificing too. It wasn't his story, or her story. It was their story, and it's time it was told truthfully.